that, that's fine. So uh, thank you very much for coming on here. So what we're going to do is we're just going to talk about uh, the music that you were into growing up, how you learned your musical instrument, what your thoughts are on songwriting and playing gigs, like that sort of thing. All right. Well, I'm an open book and like yeah. feel free to That's cool, give me man. some rockets or zingers if you want. I'm, I'm cool with everything, man. That's cool, man. So, so just uh, first of all, where is it you are from? So I was uh, born and raised in El Paso, Texas. Uh, moved out when I was 20, 20, 20. Yeah. yeah. And uh, when you were younger, what, were you into music when you were just, just a wee kid? Yeah, no. So I started playing when I was seven. So what used to happen when I was younger, like five or six, is um, my dad was an avid golfer. And so he'd go out golfing on the weekends. And then uh, he'd bring all his friends over back to the house like three in the morning. And they would set up their amps and kind of like have a little jam session in the living room. And as a little kid, it would wake me up and I would be curious. And I would just kind of like peek around the corner and watch him jam. And what, and, what sort of music was your dad and his friends into? It was like country, so like Merle Haggard, Hank Williams, uh, Texas Tornadoes, kind of stuff like that. So was that your early influences? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because I, I wanted to be, I, obviously I wanted to be like that, you know what I mean? I was a little kid, I, I was like, this is awesome. Yeah. And at what age did you, did you develop your own taste now? Previous people that I've spoke to, normally when you reach about ten or eleven here, you kind of you go from the we call it primary school up to high school, and it's normally around that age, just before you become a teenager, that you all of a sudden develop your own musical taste. You get exposed to different bands and musicians. What was it for you? Like, was there a point where you kind of developed your own musical taste? So I used to, obviously, like, I guess like most kids, you grow up listening to whatever's on the radio because it's accessible. Of and so I was a skateboarder kid. So I first heard uh, <clears throat> a band called The Descendants. Mm -hmm. And when I heard of that band, it was called, uh, the album was called I Don't Want to Grow Up. And after that, I was on a mission to find, like, punk rock music and people that liked that kind of music. So I kind of always hung around older people, so it was not too hard to find. So it was that I would say that's the first record that flipped my wow music is cool switch. Yeah. Uh, do you do you remember what the first do you remember what the first album was that you bought with your own money as a child? Oh man. There's been a lot of sleeps in between. Um <laughs> <laughs> No, I can't. To be honest with you, I really can't. Even. What about? Do you remember your first concert that you went to? Oh yeah, first concert I definitely remember. That would be uh, Ian Moore. Yeah, it was in El Paso. I had a friend uh, take me. He's like, "Hey, you got to check." He was a guitar player guy. I actually got to look him up now that, it, that you mentioned that. Uh, but I was like, "Wow!" Th like to see the stage and to see them like actually performing music live as opposed to like on a television or on a radio. It was. It was, I was struck, you know what I mean? It is, it's very different, especially the, the crowd atmosphere is something that you definitely do not get from listening to an album at home. Yeah, so, the live experience is totally different. Because it's that, that, when you're that good at that level, the energy that you command in a room, it's just, uh, it's uh, exponential. Yeah, yeah, definitely agree. And um, are you... Uh, you just play is it just guitar that you play well i'm a i'm a singer songwriter so i learned how to sing uh probably about seven well i wouldn't say i still i haven't figured it all out yet but i started singing about seven or eight years ago and playing guitar when i was seven so there's like a big um proficiency difference in my vocal ability versus uh, guitar playing ability so how how did you learn to play guitar? Was that your your dad that showed you? Absolutely, yeah. So what what would happen is he would go to work, 
and I would, he had his guitars in the closet. And I would sneak in the closet and go grab the guitars and start playing them. And then I got yeah. busted and he ended up buying me my own guitar, so I wouldn't touch his. And did, did you ever get actual proper lessons or was it just by ear and by your dad? No, it was actually my peers. I, I had some really cool uh, friends that played instruments. Mm -hmm. And so they taught me. I learned how to read like uh, shape notes, you know, like traditional music. Yes. Uh, and I took, um, I, I was in guitar, like classical guitar class in the sixth grade. Uh, but once I learned tablature, which is like a, basically a map of the fretboard, yep. then it was like, it's like learning on steroids. Cause now I could learn every song that I've ever wanted to play and how to play it note for note. And, and what, what about singing then? Did you, how, did you learn to sing or yeah. was it something that you just gave it a shot? Well, that's an interesting story because uh, when I was like 17, we got signed to an indie label and uh, I was just a guitar player only. So the singer had quit because he had another side project and it kind of left a bad taste in my mouth. I quit playing guitar for about 10 years. And then when I got back into it, I saw this band called Cadillac 3 in uh, downtown Las Vegas. And I thought, man, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to do it. And that's what I figured out. I need to learn how to sing so that I could at least goes like what I'm doing now is going solo if I have to. Yeah. And so did you learn, did you just give it a shot uh, as in trying? Because I, I mean, a lot of singing it, I think a lot of people don't realize a lot of singing is just pure confidence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of it. That's a lot of it. Uh, I did take two formal classes. Um, but then I started researching, like, because now with the information age, YouTube, there's a, mm -hmm. a gentleman, uh, Aaron Anastasi, that does a uh, vocal stuff on YouTube. And so I just started downloading all of his uh, lessons and I bought his program. And I just made a little CD that I would sing with in the car. And with no one around, you know, I was able to build my confidence, but I had to develop the muscles. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like a few. I properly started singing only a few years ago. I was always up playing guitar like yourself mm -hmm. and backing singing, which is a lot easier. But it was only maybe about two years ago I started properly being the, the front person and actually singing. And it's amazing because when I first started, you know, I would maybe sing for an hour and my throat, would st my voice would start to go. I was obviously doing it wrong. And at the moment I'm doing gigs that are three hours long and it, it's okay. So it's obviously a learning process. You, you, you know, you learn how to actually use the muscles, I suppose. Um, yeah, so it, it was a learning process, um, learning to sing, but it, I'm glad that I stuck it out because now, yeah. similar to yourself, if I want to play in a band, I can do that. If I want to go solo, I'm not relying on anybody else. I can, I can still do it. But uh, tell us, so did you start playing, ba playing in bands when you were a teenager? Yeah, I think the first band I was in, I was probably 13, 14 years old. And it was just, you know, neighborhood kids. It's like, yep. figuring out how to, figuring out how to figure it out. You know what I mean? So what, what sort of style? Would you, or what type of music would you compare yourself to back then? Oh, back then, it was like we got influenced a lot by that grunge scene in Seattle. So like a Nirvana, Soundgarden, uh, yeah. Mud Honey. And plus, I before that, I was already listening to like a lot of punk rock music, the Misfits, mm -hmm. uh, DRI. I was actually a huge Beatles fan, but it was everything from the Beatles to Metallica to... Yeah. It was. It's just a. Oh, I have a really eclectic. And now that I've done this for this much longer, it's like people are shocked that I like. I actually love rap music. I love jazz. I love all styles of music. You know. Yeah. So like when when I was starting out, it was all the the heavy metal rock mm -hmm. stuff. Was your Metallica, your Pantera, Slayer, all these type of bands. Yeah. 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 And then, I like the grunge stuff, so I really like Pearl Jam, Soundgarden. There you go, Pearl Jam, yep. 
I wasn't so much into the the new metal like Corn and Death Tones. That wasn't really my thing. I liked some Same. of the stuff, um, but then I also still had my dad's influences. So he he, he liked the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the Doors, Creedence Clearwater Revival, and then uh, and then you develop your own kind of taste somewhere in between. I kind of just jumped between all genres. Yeah, that we sound that's exactly like that was my CD collection back then. But yeah. what's weird is I took a weird turn um to the blues so and jazz. So I got into like Steve Ray Vaughn big time like that. That man changed my life. Uh and he's actually the reason why I set my guitars up the way I set them up. Mm -hmm. Uh BB King, uh Albert yep. King, Muddy Waters, Helen Wolf. Uh, Robert Johnson, all those, all those legendary guys is what um, I was kind of being fed from uh, a coworker in El Paso, and it was just like I, could, I, I just couldn't get enough. It was, it was, it was, oh, it was wild, you know. He's like, I was like, what else do you have? What you know, he'd give me like a CD every week just so I could absorb it. Yeah, I think about must be about maybe twenty years ago, pro probably more than that. Um, I saw Gary Moore. In, the, in Glasgow in concert. So Gary Moore was obviously, he played with Leonard Skinner for a bit. Wow. And then he obviously went solo, but it was like hard rock blues type mm -hmm. stuff playing. And uh, he, his guitar that's, that's really was really famous because the original guitarist, the owner of it, was um, Mick Fleetwood from Fleetwood Mac. Yeah, wow. So he had his guitar and he sold it. Gary Moore had it for years and years. And then eventually the person that has it at the moment is Kirk Hammett from Metallica. So he plays oh. with the same guitar. So the, the guitar itself, it must, it's, I think it's a Les Paul, but it must be 40 or 50 years old and it's still getting used on stage every night, which is pretty cool. Is, is it Greeny? Are you talking about Greeny? Yeah, that's the one. Okay, yeah, actually, actually, I just saw, uh, I recently saw, um, not a documentary, but like a little reel about the story about Greeny, about how he wired the pickup upside down, or... It, it created like this weird sound, but in a good way, and they just decided yeah. to... But it's Kirk Hammett from Metallica, is currently the owner of it, uh, until he decides to, to sell it on to someone else. Yeah, I'm sure he'll pass it down to his kids if he has any. But I, I actually own a, an 85 Les Paul Custom that I just... It's probably my biggest prized possession. And that, that guitar has been played to death, but it just feels so right. comfortable in your hand. It, it's a, it's an amazing instrument. And it, for an 85, I guess I don't know if that was a good or a bad year for Gibson, but this guitar in particular was created by Craftsman, that's for sure. Right. So see, at the moment, are you? do you play, is it completely solo, or do you play as part of a band? No, I play, uh, well, I used to, the way Single Brass Faction originated is it was a trio, and I've always tried to keep it a trio, just because you're managing um, time schedules and personalities. Mm -hmm. uh, but then as you go through the trials and tribulations of life, you know, people, some people have different commitment than others, which is fine. So I ended up just going solo because I wasn't going to be stopped. But I, I would eventually like to go again full, where I'm able to do electric, full electric with a three-piece. So you, you have played in bands. In your opinion, what makes a band work and what makes it not work? Good question. You know what I think makes it work is being able to live and manage and understand other people's demons enough to get through that process to create the magic. Because mm -hmm. in, my, in my personal opinion, if you have a band with no drama and everyone's like on time, and it, it, it's just not something that I grew up with, but learning to adapt to other people's personalities and kind of like, oh, you know, Navigating through that whole situation, it, it makes you like a little bit tighter, you know, obviously hitting the road makes you a lot tighter, but yeah. just, just cause it's like you're married to those people, you know what I mean? You deal with their personal issues or anything they're dealing with and, and 
It's just how you react to it and how you support them or don't support them. And that's, you know, that's what makes like really strong bands. They, they get that. You know what I mean? They, they like, this is rock and roll time. And then it's like, this is personal time. And this, you know, they, they compartmentalize it or, you know, when you get that big, but it's getting yeah. through that phase. Yeah. I mean, it's probably a combination of things. So definitely personalities is a big one, but yeah. just probably. Maybe part of the reason why a lot of bands don't have the, the same lineup for a long time. It, it's hard work to get on with another three, four, five people. Uh, I suppose ability is another one. You know, everyone's got to have a right. be on the same level. Right. And um, I mean, there's got to be a fun element to it. You know, if there's no fun, then it just turns into a job. Or to finish off, I was like, yeah, I. I I definitely bring the fun to the table, uh, so that's never an issue. Um, how much fun can you handle is, is probably the better question. <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> but it, it's so, it's a it's a weird dynamic because I think the most um, I would I don't want to use the word toxic, but the most I, I I'm at a loss for words. The I guess the more you've gone through the better the music you know what i mean yeah it's, yeah another thing you also need is it's sometimes sometimes helpful if you have three or four people in your band that there's a leader there's one person that is steering the ship mm -hmm. rather and and the other three are comfortable with letting them steer it correct I, I normally yeah. assume that leadership position. That's just my personality trait. And I mean, in all reality, I'm the one doing all the work. I'm the way I'm the one booking all the shows. I'm the one doing all the legwork. So, but personally, I, I think that is required mm -hmm. for it to work. Yeah, yeah. You need direction. Everyone need. Everyone likes direction. Even even me as a as a pretty dominant uh, personality type. Um, I still like direction. You know what I mean? It's like. I could do a lot of things, but what is it exactly that you want me to do? You know, it's like, even when I book a gig, well, how much do you charge? I was like, well, how much do you want? Do you want me to book the full <laughs> ticket? Do you want me to just play for 30 minutes? Like it, it all varies, you know? So it, it, it's like, you know, it, it's just a communication thing. It, it's funny that um, I think I was in construction for 10 years. And being a musician for this long, as I realize, like people still are cavemen in a lot of ways, and it's just getting through that that communication barrier that, that that's what leads to success. Yeah. So how how do you go about songwriting? How how do you write a song now? For for example, with myself, mm -hmm. I always come up with a guitar riff or the chords or. That, that comes first and vocals, melody comes last. That That's for me. What about yourself? So the process I go through is like, I figure out kind of what I want to say. I guess what I do is I go, I figure out what uh, emotions I want to project. And then I go through what chord progressions are going to kind of uh, contribute to that emotion. But I have to come up with something cool at least for me, uh, guitar wise, because that's where I'm dominant. Mm -hmm. And then the words just then once I have that foundation, then I can fill the words in and figure out um, phrasing and and song structure. And if you're playing with a band, do you bring in a song that's pretty much complete and then let the others add their parts to it to make the overall things hopefully sound better? Well, that's the whole direction part of it. So I, I will introduce, like I have a catalog probably of recordable songs, probably about 50 to 60. So there's a, there's probably about another two or 300 ideas out there that haven't been put together. But what I like to do is put together, I like to put together the framework and then see what other uh, uh, musicians introduce to that frame. Yeah. Like, do you want to cut a window in here? Or do you want to move the door? You know what I mean? I don't I don't structure it so uh, rigidly. I kind of let that creative process work or if you know. Yeah, so I had a I had an upright bass player, a drummer from Venezuela, and I used to just let these guys just like do your thing, man. 
Yep. Like, and then I would just sit back and watch because it was just so cool. You know what I mean? They were so locked in and they could play off each other and they were so musically inclined mm -hmm. that it was like, I'm going to go grab a seat in the audience. Like, this is awesome. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was like, oh, forget me. But um, I, 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 don't, I don't like to dictate creativity. So I, I actually really encourage it because I think it adds to the song. That's that whole... That's that whole magic part of it. But what I don't like to do is just kind of walk in and say, well, what do you want to play today? It's it's too broad, you know? You're quite happy to let the, the guys do their own thing. And if it's if it's going off in the wrong direction, pull them back. But other than that, leave them to it. They know what they're doing. Well, I'll still let them run away. Like, oh, there's no leashes in my, you know, in my uh, camp. It's like if, if you want to experiment on this, you're going to stumble onto something that we never would have done if we hadn't have gone that direction. So let's let's get carried away. You know what I mean? That's definitely always an option. Um, but at, at a certain point, it becomes non-productive. Yeah. yeah. You know, and so you have to just kind of regu um, recognize when when a, when a um, search for a sound or a, an idea becomes non-productive then you kind of kind of reel it in and and say like well hey this these are the let's analyze what we like we we like these parts let's just build on these stones and then yeah. take it from there or switch gears all together put that on the shelf and then you know we can work on something else if you want that and here's some ideas that i've come up with or if anyone else has any ideas you know what i mean i'm i'm open to that too so um, last year, I think it was that you released the album Lands and Grooves. Yes, sir. Um, was that a band? You, a, a band like was that all yourself, or was that other musicians playing on it as well? That was uh, all me, uh, but I had a tremendous boost. I had an angel fly down from heaven, and his name was uh, Joseph Abraham. And uh, I met him in a, at the uh, airport in Austin, Texas. And he's truly the reason why that record's done. So I give all my props to that gentleman. Because um, if it wasn't for him, I probably still wouldn't be done with it. Right. But he, uh, without going into too many details, he basically paved the road of gold for me. And I just had to follow it. And it was just like the... I mean, I'm talking about a person I've never even met before in real life, you know, just through social media and the, the generosity and hospitality that he extended. Um, I'll be in, I'll be forever in his debt. You know what I mean? Just because yeah. I've been able to do so much with the record so far. So, and where was where was it recorded? It was recorded in El Paso, Texas, but I flew to uh, Las Vegas to mix and master it. With uh, at the gas station recording studios with Tyler Gaston and an, another beautiful soul, like this guy. It, it's funny because a lot of people, you know, you work with a lot of different producers, and um, they always interject their own style. And I kind of like, I, I know what I want to do. Yeah. So with Tyler, I said, um, I don't want to stifle your creativity. So let me hear what you're hearing in your head. And then I'll either thumbs up it or thumbs down it, you know what I mean? Or, or build on it if it's something I can work with. And so I kind of let him have a little bit of freedom that, that I normally wouldn't release, you know what I mean? Because it was a solo record and it was something like, Lands and Grooves is a really personal record for me. Um, but he really elevated it to a whole nother level. He's like, what do you think about this? And I'm like, oh man, just, just keep going, man. Just keep going. Do whatever you're doing, keep going. So. Uh are you currently getting that, the, the songs from that album just now? Did I say it again? Are you playing gigs? Are you, are you playing live that album just now to help advertise it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to support it. So I recently re relocated to Houston. Okay. So my plan right now is I'm going to um, try to play as much as possible in Houston before I venture off into... Uh, I'll go from Houston throughout Texas into Oklahoma. And then I'm gonna eventually work my way to the West Coast and then come back. And then I'll try to focus on the East Coast and then come back and then try to figure out, like, 
you know, music is a business in a sense, you know what I mean? Figure out where I won, where I lost, and then kind of put all that together and then just kind of expand the whole thing to where I'm doing it 24-7. Yeah. Right, Gil, so last question for you. Okay. Mount Rushmore, who is your top musicians or bands, the ones that you put at the very top, who are the four, that, whether it be songwriting, whether it be performance, whether it just be the overall band, who are the four bands that you put wow. at the top of your list? Cool question. All right, so number one spot goes, to, well, I guess it's not in order, right? So firstly, Steve Ray Vaughan would definitely yes. be up there. Uh, another huge influence to me is Jaron Johnston of the Cadillac 3. Another huge influence. Um, I would have to say, um, I don't, I'm going to count them as one, but the John Lennon and Paul McCartney um, combination. So I'm just going to call it the Beatles. We'll just okay. glue their heads together. And then I'm going to give uh, the last spot to uh, Mr. John Coltrane, tenor saxophonist. There you go. Right, Gil, thank you very much for coming on. Thank um, you. Thank you for having me. Hopefully I can edit this all together and cut out all the, the gaps, but it, it's been good speaking to you, and I'll, I'll keep in touch with you. I'll follow you over social media and uh, find out how the tunes are going, and uh, you can keep in touch and let me know as well. Yeah, likewise. Let me know how I can promote uh, what we just did in your station and your, in your movement, and and I'll, I'm definitely one to support people that support me. You know what I mean? Definitely. Thank you very much, Gil. Thank Until you. Have a good one. Awesome. <laughs> cool.